I'm not sure if my message is going to be as long as that introduction, <laughs> but I will do my best. <laughs> Such a pleasure to be here, Pastor Albert. Pastor Grace, thank you so much. Uh, well, what time am, am I supposed to be done? I notice there's a clock up here. <laughs> that's, a, that's a hint, right? No, we're, we, just go. we just go. Three or four o'clock is fine. Okay, all right, I got it. Now, in his introduction to us, uh, Pastor Albert mentioned that I, I taught healing. And so today I don't feel like teaching healing because I think you are doing very, very well in healing. And I know some of you have come to be healed. And so Pastor Albert and Pastor Grace are going to take care of you after the message. I do have a different kind of message to share with you, something which I feel is very, very important. And as I share this message, uh, I'm going to share a little bit about our background. I'm going to share about our eternal reward in the kingdom of God. And I'm going to share about what exactly determines your eternal reward in the age to come. Okay? Not here on earth, but we're talking about storing our treasure in heaven. I'm going to start with what I call the indescribable love of God. Before, when we were worshiping the Lord, there were expressions like um, the glorious presence of the Lord. There was another expression, fathomless billows of his love. That's something that I experienced back in 1977. At that time, I was a graduate student at the University of California, San Diego. I was within about a year of getting my PhD. And my wife, well, my wife had originally come from Indonesia. We were married in 1974. And uh, we were headed for the American dream. I would get my PhD. I would get a job teaching at a university and earn a decent salary and be able to buy a house and have two or three cars in our driveway, and then have children and so forth, uh, we were heading for the American dream. But in 1977, after I had been a Christian for one year, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and that changed everything for me because I felt the love of God in a way that was indescribable. I felt the glory of His presence, Really, I felt the billows of his fathomless love, and it changed me completely. I forgot everything about the American dream, and all I wanted to do was tell people about Jesus, about how much he loved them, because I had experienced that fathomless love, and all I wanted to do was tell people about that love. And so because I felt the love of God, I just wanted to obey him. I wanted to do what he commanded us to do. And in his word, he commands us to go, right? Preach the gospel to all creation. And to me, that made a lot of sense because whatever I had, everyone else had to have as well. It was so, so wonderful. He saved me. He gave me eternal life. He lived in me. And so I obeyed the Lord. I began to serve him. And what did I do? Well, I gave up the American dream. I withdrew from graduate studies, and I decided to go to seminary. Now, in seminary, I did not last long, because in seminary, I found it quite dry. We were just studying in a very academic fashion. It was very similar to what I was doing in secular graduate school, but now the subject had changed. Now we were studying the Bible, and we were reading textbooks written by fallible human authors about the Bible. What I really wanted to do was do what was in the Bible. I wanted to do what I saw in the book of Acts, not just study about it and read papers about it. And so very quickly I became bored, and I said to myself, I don't have time to get my master's. It takes three years, and what if Jesus returns and I'm still in seminary? I will have wasted my time. I have to serve the Lord now. And if you want to serve the Lord in the United States, it's not so easy. You do need a degree, a seminary degree. You need ordination. There are all kinds of qualifications that you need to fulfill. And I didn't have time to fulfill those qualifications. And I thought to myself, where should I go? 
Where should I go? I want to be a missionary. And it turns out that my wife, Lucille, in 1970, she left Indonesia and came, excuse me, went to America in search of the American dream. She grew up in Jakarta, and uh, she was Chinese. And uh, as many of you know, uh, Chinese do not exactly feel secure in Indonesia. And so when she had the opportunity to leave Indonesia and go to the United States to pursue uh, higher education, she made a vow. She said, I will never, ever go back to Indonesia. I'm going to America, and I'm going to find the American dream there. Goodbye, Indonesia. Okay, that's what happened in 1970. We got married in 1974. 1976, I accepted Jesus at a Billy Graham crusade. And then 1977 was when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's what I'm describing to you. I felt the indescribable love of God in my heart, which turned my world upside down. And so I wanted to serve the Lord. I wanted to go someplace where people had never heard of Jesus. And so I wanted to be a missionary. And suddenly I remembered... My wife is from Indonesia. I said, hey, why don't we go to Indonesia as missionaries and preach the gospel there? And so I went to Lucille and I mentioned to her, hey, how about Indonesia? And in her mind's eye, she could see her American dream sprout wings and fly off into the distance way in the horizon. Goodbye, American dream. Lucille, she was already a believer. And of course, she feared the Lord. So she prayed and asked the Lord to guide her. The Lord gave her peace. And she said, OK, I will go with you to Indonesia. And so, in 1978, we left for Indonesia, and it was in a very radical way. We had no financial support from any church, zero financial support from any churches. I did not have the covering of any mission board or mission agency. No one sent us. There was no organization or church in Indonesia which had invited us. We had nothing. We were just going to trust the Lord to open the way for us. And God was very gracious. He did open doors for us, and we stayed there nine years. We ended up in Kalimantan. Not Jakarta, but in Kalimantan, in the jungles. Di hutan. <laughs> we ministered in places where there was no electricity, in unreached villages, where there were no bathrooms, no kitchens, no running water. The only thing we had was a river running right in front of our house. So where do you go when you need to go? You go to the river. Where do you go when you need to wash the dishes? To the river. Where do you go when you want to brush your teeth? To the river in exactly the same place. Okay, so what made us do such a crazy thing? Okay, it's crazy, right? At least humanly speaking, it's nuts to do such a thing. Can you imagine we left the United States and went halfway around the world all the way to Kalimantan to tell people about Jesus? Isn't that crazy? Well, the reason why I did it was because of the love of God. He had saved me. He had forgiven me of my sins. He had given me a new nature. I was a new creature. I had to obey him. And so we obey and we work for the Lord because of his love for us as evidenced by his death on the cross. Okay? That's why we obey him. That's why we serve him. That's why we work for the Lord. Because of what he has already done for us. Today we want to look at a, um, take another look at the role of our works, our good works for the Lord. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, For we are all, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ to do good works, 
which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we are not clearly saved by works. No, we're not saved by works. But after we are saved, we will do good works, which God has prepared us to do. So let's look at these good works. What's the result of doing good works for the Lord? What is exactly the result? First Peter 1, verse 17. Peter says, Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. So here it says that the father will judge our work impartially. Okay? Now, this judgment it does not mean being sent to heaven or being sent to hell. It's not talking about that kind of judgment, all right? But it's talking about evaluating our work here on earth as born-again believers. He's going to judge our work. He's going to evaluate what kind of work have we done here for the Lord as believers who are already saved. And Peter says, therefore, Live your lives here on earth as strangers in reverent fear, fear of the Lord. So we not only know the love of God, but we also know the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, here we see this word again, judgment. Okay. Now, the we here refers to all born-again believers. That's the we. Every believer will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. In Greek, they call it the, uh, the bima, I think. And what's going to happen to us when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ? That each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And so, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, our works that we have done here on earth for the Lord will be judged, will be evaluated. And based on that evaluation, we will receive from the Lord a reward, an eternal reward for the things well done in the body, whether good or bad. Now, how many of you don't mind doing thing don't mind doing bad things while you're here on earth raise your hand if you don't mind doing bad things okay good how many of you would rather do good things for the lord while here on earth yes obviously okay okay we're going to look at this what does it mean by good what does it mean by bad all right now we're talking about believers now we're not talking about unbelievers we're talking about born again believers now, after Christ returns, we will all, meaning we all, all of us believers will appear before his judgment seat to receive our eternal reward. And this is not salvation, not salvation. But eternal reward is in addition to salvation, all right? So when I say eternal reward, I'm not talking about salvation or eternal life. Got that? All right. And our eternal reward will be according to the works that we have done here on earth. So, our salvation, of course, is not by works, not by good works, but our eternal reward does, is determined by our good works here on earth. Again, eternal reward above and beyond salvation. All right? In other words, all of us, we receive the same salvation. We repent, we believe in Jesus Christ, we have faith in him, we obey him, we have eternal life by grace. It's the same eternal life. But we will not all receive the same eternal reward in the kingdom of God. Because that eternal reward will depend upon your works here on earth. Now, let's see if the Bible teaches us how to maximize our eternal reward from the Lord. How many of you are interested in maximizing your eternal reward in the kingdom of God? Raise your hand. Okay, thank you. So, I gather that those of you who did not raise your hand 
All you care about is just making it to heaven. Okay? And that's fine. That's, that's really up to you. And of course, making it to heaven is the most important thing. Exactly. Okay? But I notice some of you actually care about what kind of eternal reward you're going to receive at the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm in that category. <laughs> I'm very concerned about my eternal reward. All right? My salvation is settled. I'm not worried about that at all. Now, when I'm working, I'm working for eternal reward. Now, of course, yes, what I mentioned earlier, the love of God. Okay, that's why we obey the Lord, because His love. But it turns out that He also said, I'm going to reward you for what you have done for me on earth. And so we shouldn't forget that. Let's see what Scripture says about the determination of your eternal reward in the age to come. It turns out that the quality of your work counts. The quality. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. Now, of course, these are the words spoken by the Apostle Paul. And what the Apostle Paul did was he would go out and preach the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that would be the foundation that he laid. The foundation was Jesus Christ. And then uh, there would be others who came in who would serve in that very same area where Paul preached the gospel. And they would be building on the foundation that Paul had already laid. Okay? And so let's apply this to here, Faithline Church, okay? Pastor Albert, Pastor Grace, they have laid a very good foundation in this church, okay? And I see there are quite a few of you others, you are co-workers with them, and you are building on this foundation, okay, this church. Let's see what Paul says about building on the foundation. Each one should build with care, each co-worker here should build with care. Why? If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, now, uh, that means something that's very expensive, very dear, very precious, not easy to get, all right? So some will build with gold, silver, costly stones, and others will build with wood, hay, or straw. So you have a choice of what kind of materials with which you're going to build on the foundation already laid here. Either gold, silver, costly stones, very expensive, very dear, hard to come by, or wood, hay, or straw, which are cheap and plentiful. Verse 13, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light, meaning the day in which we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, our work will be evaluated. How? It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. And so, here, while we're still on earth, uh, no one knows what kind of materials you're using, all right? No one really knows. No one knows the motivation in your heart. No one knows why you're serving here. Okay? Because in, in some churches, people serve for recognition, for example. Or they serve for money. Okay? And so here on earth, we might not know what kind of materials people are using to serve. But on that day, the day of judgment, it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of our work. On that day, the Lord will know. We will know what materials you've been using, whether gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, or straw. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If you have been building on a foundation using gold, silver, precious stones, you will receive your eternal reward in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ. If it is burned up, you will suffer loss. Meaning if you have used wood, hay, and straw, 
and building on the foundation here, you're going to suffer loss. Your works will be burned up by the fire. You yourself will be saved. Glory, hallelujah. But only as one escaping through the flames. Do you get that? All right. You're saved. Your salvation is settled. But because you have been using wood, hay, and straw to build on the foundation, all of your works have been burned up, and you will suffer loss of eternal reward. You will just barely make it into the kingdom of God. <laughs> okay. So, how many of you would rather use gold, silver, and precious stones as you serve here? Ah, wonderful. Praise the Lord. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> All right. So, we conclude that we must use costly materials for the Lord's work. Now, what does it mean to use costly materials? Well, I believe it's very individual. All right? It depends on what you're called to do. But one thing is involved, and that is your motivation. Okay? Why are you doing this? Okay? I believe there are... Well, I'm not going to say too much, but I believe there are servants of God who serve for glory, earthly glory, or who serve for money. Okay? That's wood, hay, and straw. Okay? So, obviously, this will mean different things for different people. Okay? It depends on your calling. depends on what you're called to do. But for myself personally, I strive to be very diligent and careful with Scripture because I'm a teacher, and teachers will be more strictly judged, according to James. So when it comes to teaching, I'm very, very conservative, extremely conservative. If it's not in Scripture, if it's not strongly supported by Scripture, I stay away from it, especially I'm not going to teach it to others. I only teach things that are strongly supported in Scripture. And I do seek to work hard and conscientiously. Okay. I sacrifice and I store my treasure in heaven. I store my treasure in heaven. Okay. And so whenever I travel, I never demand a certain honorarium. No, never. They ask me, uh, what are your requirements, Pastor William? I say, none. <laughs> But it would be nice if you gave me a hotel and meals. <laughs> uh, as far as honorarium, whatever. Whatever you would like to give. Okay. Now, and so quality is important. We must use gold, silver, precious stones. And I believe that has meaning to each and every one of you who serve here at Faithline. Okay. And so quality is important. That's obvious. But interestingly, the scripture also teaches that quantity is important. That's a bit surprising. Because we always say quality, not quantity. We like to say that. But we're going to see that scripture also teaches that quantity is important. Why? Because God is fair. God is fair. He looks at both quality and quantity. We're going to look at the parable of the minas where we have ten servants, and each one of them are of equal ability. Luke 19, verse 12, Jesus said, he's giving them a parable, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. All right, who, who is this nobleman? Jesus is talking about himself. He's going to go back to the father's house, and then at some point he's going to return. All right? Okay? He's talking about himself here. So he called ten of his servants and gave them each ten minas. Therefore, each servant had equal ability. They were each given one mina. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. And so, again, I want to stress, each of the ten servants had equal ability. Then the master went away. And after a long while, he returned. And then he called his servants to account for what they had done with the mina that he entrusted to them. Verse 16. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Now, that's pretty good. 
That's 1,000% return. He turned one mina into 10. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. Okay, we see something very interesting there. He took one mina, he turned it into 10, and his reward was authority over 10 cities. You see some sort of proportionality there? You see some kind of pattern coming up? And so he was trustworthy with just one mina. And his master was so pleased with him, he put him in charge. He gave him authority in the master's kingdom to reign over 10 cities. And so the master rewarded the servant according to the quantity of his production. The second servant came and said, Sir, you mean has earned five more. His master answered, you take charge of five cities. Now the pattern is becoming more clear, right? We see a pattern emerging. Likewise, the master rewarded the second servant according to the quantity of his production as well. Is that clear? Is that clear? Okay. The more the servant earned for his master, the more authority he was given to rule in the kingdom of his master. Hmm. Okay. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in. You reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. Then he said to those standing by, Take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. The third servant received no reward at all. How many of you don't mind being this third servant? Raise your hand. Okay. Oh, I see a half a hand raised over there. Oh, no, you're just scratching your neck. Sorry, sorry. Be careful with your hands when I ask those questions. Okay. Keep it on your lap. Okay. How many of you would rather be like the first servant? Raise your hand. Okay. Good, all right. How about the second servant? Raise your hand. Okay. At least you're honest, brother. <laughs> yes, yes. We appreciate honesty. Yeah. All right. So this third servant lost what he had. And so look what the Apostle Paul says, Second Timothy 2.12. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we endure to the end, we will reign with him, with Christ, in the next age, in his kingdom. And so I believe that parable is talking about, in the next age, Christ will reign, and we will reign with him. He will entrust a certain amount of authority to each one of us to reign over his kingdom. All right? The more fruitful we have been here, the greater authority we will have in his kingdom to reign with him. Okay? Our eternal reward will consist in part of authority to reign with Jesus Christ in his kingdom in the next stage. All right? So you know that in heaven, we're not going to be reclining on a cloud with an angel playing the harp, tossing grapes into our mouth. Okay, that's nonsense, right? That's not heaven. That's not heaven. Amen? Okay. And heaven, I don't think, is either 24 hours a day worshiping the Lord. I don't think we're going to be doing that 24, I mean, forever and ever, just standing there worshiping God. There's going to be work to do in the kingdom of God. We'll be reigning with him in his kingdom. And some say millennial kingdom, all right? And so, and you know what else? The Lord enables us to produce a lot of fruit for him in his harvest fields so that we can store our treasure in heaven. Now, how does he enable us to produce more fruit for him so that we increase our eternal reward? He gives us power 
through the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. You have received the Holy Spirit, which means you have received power to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. And what is a witness of Jesus Christ does? He heals the sick who are there, and then he tells them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. See, Jesus Christ has given you this power, this authority, so that you can win souls, so that you can preach the gospel, just as the disciples did in the book of Acts. And when you do that, you will reap a great harvest of souls for the kingdom of God. And the greater harvest you reap, the greater the quantity of the harvest that you reap, I believe the greater your eternal reward in heaven. Amen. And so the teaching that I have been giving you these past three days, that's one means by which you can store up more of your treasure in heaven by going out, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, going on mission trips, going to Saba, going to Sarawak on mission trips and winning entire villages for the kingdom of God. I believe that will increase your eternal reward in heaven. Okay? And so I'm not saying that you have to go on a mission trip in order to be saved. I'm not saying that at all, all right? But I'm saying you want a bigger eternal reward? Obey God. Serve him. Obey the Great Commission. Go out. Preach the gospel. Heal the sick. That's one way. That's one way of increasing your reward in heaven. Now, of course, there are other ways, but this is definitely one way. What did Jesus say? Pray that the Lord will raise up and send forth workers into his harvest field. He did pray that. He wants workers for the harvest field. That's important for him. And if you're going to go out there and harvest, that is one way of storing your treasure in heaven. And I believe the more fruitful you are on the harvest field in terms of winning souls, the greater your reward at the judgment seat of Christ. All right? And look at this. You will also receive authority to judge. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? Do you not know that we will judge angels? Authority is what we will receive from the Lord in the next age. Authority. But there's a problem here. Okay, Notice that in that parable... Those ten servants were all of equal ability. Is that realistic? Yes or no? Are we all of equal ability here? No. Okay. God has given Pastor Albert lots of ability. Okay. That's clear. All right. And with all that ability, he's going to do a lot for God. Right. So how can you possibly get the same reward as Pastor Albert? And Pastor Grace, you see what I mean? Okay, he was born with this ability, and you were not. So he's going to have a bigger reward than you. Is that fair, actually? Is that fair? Yes or no? It's not fair. Correct, it's not fair. So let's examine this issue. Because God should be fair, right? Shouldn't God be fair? Should, shouldn't God take into account the ability with which we were given, the ability that he gave us, shouldn't he take that into account? Yes. So let's look at another parable in which there were three servants of differing ability. Matthew 25, verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Now, this parable is very similar to the other one, right? So far. Okay, a man going on a journey and then later coming back, Jesus is talking about himself, right? Okay. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. So now this parable is different from the other one. Now we have three servants and each are of different ability. This one is more realistic, right? Okay, more realistic. Uh, Pastor Albert has five talents, and you have two talents, and you have, well, I'm not going to go that far, okay? (laughs) 
each according to his ability, right? Okay. Then the servants went off and worked, and the master went on his journey. Okay. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. Ah, and so this man doubled his master's money, okay? He received five, he made five more. He doubled his master's money. He earned five talents. And what was his reward? Let's see. Let's see what the master gave him. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. And so no precise amount is specified for his reward, right? There's no numbers here. No numbers. All we know is he's going to be put in charge of many things. Okay? That's all we know. How about the second servant? Second servant came. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. So the second servant gained two talents. The first servant gained five talents, right? So which is more, five or two? Five. So who should get the greater reward? It would seem like the first servant should get the greater, the greater reward because he made five and this second servant only made two more talents. But the second servant also doubled his master's money. Ah, do you see that? Both doubled their master's money. Yes, five is more than two, yes. But they both doubled their master's money. And what reward did the master give him? His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Those are the exact same words spoken to the first servant. <laughs> exactly the same words. So I'm suspecting that the second servant received the same reward as the first servant. And that makes sense because God is fair, right? Amen? Amen. God is fair. He knows how much ability he's given you. He knows what kind of opportunities he's given you. And so he's only going to expect from you something back proportional to what he gave you. Amen. So is it possible for any of you to, say, to receive the same reward as Pastor Albert, yes or no? Yes. yes. Did you hear that, brother? <laughs> These people, some of them can receive the same reward as you. Amen. <laughs> But you know, Grace, you're going to receive more than Pastor Albert. <laughs> because the pastor's wife always suffers more than the pastor. <laughs> the Lord takes that into account. <laughs> I've been there, I've done that, and so has Lucille. And so the Lord takes into account the ability he has given us in the determination of our eternal reward. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? God is good. All right. So he knows how much he's given you. He knows what you're capable of. As long as you produce for the Lord, using what God has given you, you can receive a maximum reward. All right, Revelation 2, verse 26. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. There you go. Authority over the nations in his kingdom, which is coming. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. 
That verse 27 looks kind of scary to me, okay? It looks kind of scary if you look at it closely, okay? There are going to be people who don't want to submit to our Lord Jesus, and they will be forced to submit. And who's going to do the forcing? <laughs> it looks like you. <laughs> Now, there is a third parable, which is kind of troubling, which you have read, which is kind of confusing. So we're going to look at this troubling parable. This is the parable of the workers in the vineyard, which seems to mess up everything that I have just said. Okay? Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. Now, Right off the bat, this parable is different from the other two. You see that? With the other two, there was a landowner who was going to go on a journey. He called some of his men, gave them something to work with, and then he went on a long journey, and then he returned. This one is different. You see that? This takes place in the space of a single day. All right? He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. Okay? He's going to give them a denarius to work for one day. About the third hour, he went out and he saw other men just standing around the marketplace, so he hired them as well and told them, go into the vineyard and work. About the sixth hour, he went out and saw more people just sitting around doing nothing, so he hired them as well and told them to work in his vineyard. About the eleventh hour, he did the same thing. He went out, saw people just hanging around, he hired them as well and sent them into his vineyard. Okay? So four times he went out to hire people. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. Hmm, all right. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So the ones who were hired last, who only worked for, I don't know, one, two hours, and it was already evening, the sun was going down, so you know, they didn't have to suffer through the heat of the day. They received one denarius, okay? And so when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. So the ones who were hired early in the morning, who, who worked you know, 8, 10, 12 hours, they expected, hey, we're going to get a lot more. Because that guy who worked only a couple hours, he got one denarius. We're, we're going to certainly get more. I mean, what's fair is fair, right? Right. But each one of them also received a denarius. Hmm. This kind of messes things up, doesn't it? Okay. And so it doesn't matter how well they worked. It doesn't matter how long they worked. They all received the same pay. So this parable seems to contradict the other two, doesn't it? Okay. But does Scripture contradict Scripture? Does Jesus contradict himself? Yes or no? No. And so we have to properly interpret what Jesus is trying to say here. Okay. First of all, this parable is different from the other two. The other two talk about a nobleman who's going on a journey, and then we'll come back. This is different. And so let's interpret this. They all received the same wages regardless of when they were hired, all right? The reasonable expectation was that the ones who worked since morning would receive much more. But all the workers received the same wages. One denarius, how do we interpret this? It must refer to our common salvation. Does it matter when you believe in Jesus with regard to your salvation? Does it matter when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? It doesn't matter one whit. Remember the thief on the cross. Before his last breath, he accepted Jesus, and Jesus said, You will be with me in paradise today. Does that thief on the cross have the same salvation as you and me? Yes. Okay. And some of you... 
You've been serving the Lord for years and years and years and years, right? You've been laboring in the Lord's harvest field for years and years, and you've been fruitful, and you're going to receive the same salvation as that thief on the cross. Yes or no? Yes, yes, yes. But there's something called eternal reward. You see that? Which does depend upon what you have done here on earth. That's the Lord, you see. That's our God. Amen? That's our God. That's our Lord. Woo! <laughs> Doesn't matter when we receive Christ with regard to salvation. Okay? Now, there's something called sin, which can cause us to suffer loss in our eternal reward. And this is where the fruit of the Holy Spirit comes into play. Um, are we all perfect? Uh, we're, we're headed that way, but we're not perfect yet. Uh, uh, do we sometimes sin? Uh, do, we, do we have to sin? Do we have to sin? Right, we don't have to sin, correct. But sometimes we do, but we don't have to sin. Let's look at this. Again, this is the Apostle Paul. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Okay. Now, he's talking about a race. If you want to win the race, it depends upon performance, correct? So what is Paul talking about here? Is, is the prize that he's talking about here salvation? It depends on your performance. You think he's talking about salvation here? There's only one person who wins the race. <laughs> you think he's talking about salvation? It doesn't seem so. Okay. Run in such a way as to get the prize. So Paul is saying, whatever this prize is, you need to run in the right way in order to get this prize. Let's find out what he's talking about when he says prize. Okay? Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Okay? Now he's using the analogy of the Olympic Games. All right? And we're all familiar with the Olympic Games, right? We watch them on TV. It's so dramatic. The last one was in Brazil. And, ooh. and you know how these Olympic athletes have to train? It's crazy. Like the swimmers, they have to train in the pool eight hours a day, and then they have a special diet, and they have to rest at least eight hours a day. You know, if I even fall into the pool, I'm dead, you know. <laughs> These swimmers, eight hours a day, okay? And the runners, okay? I don't have to say much more, right? These Olympic athletes, when they train, it's no kidding. They are dead serious. They want to win the gold medal. Okay? Strict training. Very strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Now, today, if someone wins the Olympic gold, how long does that gold last before they have to defend their crown? Just four years. Just four years. And then they have to start over. Okay, But our crown will last forever. Forever. So are we going to do what it takes to get this crown? Yes or no? Are you going to do what it takes? Whatever it takes, you're going to get this crown. All right? Okay, what is this crown? Well, a crown is awarded for superior performance, and a crown symbolizes authority, as in the crown of a king. So what do you think Paul is talking about here when he says prize? What is he talking about? Is he talking about salvation, or is he talking about eternal reward? Eternal reward. Yes, yes, yes. It depends on your performance for the Lord here in this life. Authority to reign with him in his kingdom.
Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. And so when Paul runs, it's not like, you know, <laughs> not like that. No, but it's like, <clears throat> you know, he, he's a sprinter, okay? He's dead serious. He's dead serious. When he's, tra- when he's, he's not shadow boxing like this, but he's, you know, <clears throat> you can tell I'm not a trained boxer, okay? He's dead serious, okay? He's dead serious. He's like training for the Olympics. So, what is he getting at here? What is he getting at here? Okay. I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. What does this mean? First of all, he's talking about, well, he's concerned that he could be disqualified for the prize. Is he afraid of losing his salvation? No, I don't think so. What is the prize here? Eternal reward. And Paul is concerned that he could do something to cause him to lose his eternal reward. And what is he talking about? Sin. Sin. He's talking about sin. When he says, I strike a blow to my body, he's not talking about he's beating himself physically. No, he's talking about his flesh, the works of his flesh, his old nature. He strikes a blow to it whenever it tempts him to sin. He says, no, I'm not going to sin. Get out of here. Did you copyright that, brother? If you did, I won't do it anymore. (laughs) And so we treat the works of our flesh just like we treat diseases and demons. Ha! (laughs) Got that? He strikes a blow to his body. He makes it his slave. You see, before we came to know Jesus, we were slaves to sin, correct? Correct. Sin was our master, we were its slaves. Every day, it would make us sin, our nature, our sin nature. But after we receive Jesus, our sin nature is crucified with Christ on the cross. It has lost its power over us, and now it's under our authority. Correct? Is it completely dead? No, but it's under our authority. And when our sin nature tries to tempt us to sin, we say, no, I rebuke you. Get out. So you see, it's not enough just to say, Lord, lead us not into temptation. That's not enough. You have to understand your authority over the works of your flesh. And you have to know how to use mountain moving faith to rebuke it. And then it will obey you. Just like the winds and the waves obey Jesus, your sin nature will obey you and you will escape from temptation. Okay. So you see, if we sin, if we sin against God, there's a possibility we could suffer loss in eternal reward. Now let's say, uh, let's say you, you sin, you do something. Let's say one day you're on your computer and um, you receive this strange email from someone you know, kind of weird, but you know the sender, so you click on the email, and suddenly these pornographic images explode in front of your face, okay? What are you going to do at that moment? Are you going to say, wow, I haven't seen that in a long time since my college days, woo! My wife don't look like that no more. (laughs) Oh, oh, glory to God. I'll just enjoy a few seconds because, man, I'm a man after all. This is normal. Later, I'll just go to Jesus and say, sorry, Jesus, and all will be forgiven. All will be washed away. Okay. Now, if you do confess your sin to Jesus, will he forgive you? Yes. But could there be a consequence? Yes. You see, sin can be forgiven but there could be an earthly or even an eternal consequence. 
loss of eternal reward. Okay? And so, when you turn on your computer and that pornography explodes in front of your face, what do you say? No, I rebuke you, and you delete that email immediately. Amen? That's authority, authority, authority. You have authority over your flesh. You don't have to give in to it. So it is not necessary to sin. Did you know that? Yeah, Pastor Albert has taught you that. You don't have to sin. When you do, yeah, you confess it, you're forgiven. But you don't have to sin because you have authority over your flesh. And not only that, the Holy Spirit gives you his fruit. Since then, Colossians 3 verse 1, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things things. And this is one thing that really keeps me going. I set my mind on things above. One day I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, And I want to hear from him, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. That's what I want to hear from him. So that's what really keeps me going. Okay. Someday we believers will be there. Not only to experience God's glorious presence, but to receive our eternal reward. Paul says, Romans 8.13, For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. You have the Holy Spirit, right? Holy Spirit lives in you. You have power to put to death the works of the flesh. You have authority to say no to the misdeeds of the body. And we need to use that authority. And we will live. We will live. We will live. It's through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. By the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, we are enabled to obey the Spirit of the law and to live a holy life pleasing to the Lord. And this, of course, is where the fruit of the Holy Spirit comes in. Amen? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control, gentleness, faithfulness. Was that more than nine? I lost count. Okay. Did I get it? I think so. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Does this grace give us license to sin? Is that what this grace does? Give us license to sin. I'll do whatever I want, and later I'll just confess it to Jesus, and all will be forgiven. Is that the grace of God? No. What is the true grace of God? It teaches us to say no, no, no to ungodliness and worldly passions. No, no. No, no, I rebuke you. Huh, get out of here. <laughs> and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Amen. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who will reward us according to what we have done on earth, whether good or bad? So how many of you are determined to do good here on earth? Okay. Thank you. Who doesn't mind doing bad here on earth? Oh, oh I'm sorry. You just... Okay. I thought I caught you there, uh, Elizabeth. <laughs> okay. So what has God prepared for those who love him? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Inconceivable, indescribable, unimaginable, unthinkable, fathomless. 
And who are those who love God? If you love me, keep my commands. <laughs> those are the ones who love God, right? It's not just a feeling, is it? Not just a feeling, but it's actually, it results in action. Those who love God, obey his commands. Jesus says, Revelation twenty two twelve. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. This is the reward for you and me. Amen. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Notice, it's not according to what they have believed, but it's according to what they have done. And why do we do things? Why do we do good works for God? Because of our faith. Because of our saving faith. That's why we do good works in obedience to his commands. True saving faith will result in doing good works in obedience to God's holy commands. And we're all going to do those works, right? Amen? We're all going to do these works. Every believer is going to do these good works. But now you're going to use gold, silver, precious stones. Amen? No more sloppy work. All right? No more impure motivations. Not going to cut any more quarters. No more cutting corners. Right? With all of your heart, your soul, your strength, you're going to serve the Lord and build on this foundation. Gold, silver, precious stones. Amen? Amen. And you're not looking for men's recognition. But you're looking for eternal reward in the next age. But, all right, how can we be saved? Let's go back to the beginning, all right? I've been talking to uh, believers here, but what if all of you are not believers? Maybe we have some visitors here who don't know what I'm talking about at all. (laughs) What is this guy talking about, eternal reward? Okay, let's start at the beginning. How can we be saved and we serve, receive this eternal life that I've been mentioning. How? Well, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you want to be saved, you believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. You believe he died on the cross to bear your sin. You believe... That on the third day he was raised back to life. And now he is seated at the right hand of the Father. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you shall not perish. Your sins will be forgiven, but you will have everlasting life. That's how we can be saved. But what's the evidence for this statement? Okay, What's the evidence? How do we know John 3.16 is true? What's the What's the visible evidence that this is true? John 20, verse 30. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Jesus performed many miraculous signs, especially many miraculous healing. Healings, excuse me. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, And that by believing, you may have life in his name. The reason why Jesus performed miracles, miraculous healings, was so that people would believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And if they believe in him with all of their heart, they will have life in his name. They will have eternal life. What is the evidence That Jesus is the only way to the Father. What is the evidence that only Jesus can save us? It's the miracles that he did. You want evidence? You will have the evidence this morning. Because Pastor Albert is going to lead trained believers in laying hands on the sick with power and authority and healing them. And many of them are going to come up here and testify that they are healed And then you will know that Jesus is the only way to the Father, to eternal life. You want to see the evidence? You're going to see it in a few minutes. 
as Pastor Albert and Pastor Grace lead the trained faith liners in ministering healing to the sick. How many of you need healing? Raise your hand. You've come to be healed? Okay. Raise your hand higher. Okay. Fine. Now, Pastor Albert is going to lead his team to minister healing to you. Some of you are going to be healed. And those of you who are healed, you're going to come up here and testify. Amen? Amen. If you're not willing to testify, they're not going to minister to you. So you better be willing to testify. Because your testimony is important. Why? Your testimony is the evidence that only Jesus can give eternal life. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Pastor Albert, give the floor back to you. (laughs) 